The care people get here is just amazing and every single person who works here believe in the premise that every life is important and everyone needs to be cared for. One lady told me my sister was in there and she said I think I've died and already gone to heaven because it was so different from the treatment she was getting at the hospital and they were just treating her like a person rather than an object. Woolen Hospice is one of Milton Keynes' most loved institutions. Its story is an inspiring one and begins over 40 years ago with the dreams of two remarkable people, a local GP, Marjorie Reed, and a district nurse, Dorothy Gell. As a district nurse, Mum started doing some further education. She started to have in, doing courses on care of the dying. Mum suddenly started talking about hospice care didn't know what that word meant really. Um, it was new in our new in our language, but I remember her passionately saying, if this is going to be a city, then a city needs a hospice. She then heard that Dr. Marjorie Reed, who had a surgery in Winslow, was also interested and they made contact with each other and they said we've got to get a hospice here in Milton Keynes. Between them, they said, we, we, we must get a little committee together of people and see what we can do. Marjorie said to me, well, you're minister, you better chair the first meetings. Uh, you better come along and chair it. The dying need to know that in the last hours of their illness, they will not be left alone. And although the health service for Milton Keynes is going to be comprehensive and include a new district general hospital and a new hospital for the dying, they will need I don't think it will be the case for terminal, terminally ill because I've said their needs and the needs of their family are very special and have to be catered for, if they are not to be in their own homes, by a unit specially planned for them and by a staff skilled in this sort of care. An area such as Milton Keynes would need a unit of uh, 20 to 25 beds. I don't know whether we shall ever uh, actually achieve one. It's a great dream of mine. I, I knew Marjorie Reed, you know, I'd met her socially and of course she was a committed Christian. And uh, when I joined the corporation in 1972, um, she contacted me, uh, I suppose about 18 months later. I think it was April the 26th, <laughs> 1974. And she laid out um, her position, what, her project. So it was agreed that 25,000 would be a design costs. 25,000 was a lot of money in those days. I think the equivalent from it would be about between 150 and 160,000. Come Jan, January, February of 1978, Mum became very unwell. And from becoming unwell to passing away on the 3rd of May, 1978, it was really, really quite quick. After Dorothy died, people started saying to me, come on, you really got to do something about it. And I suppose I really threw myself then into finding grants and raising money and all that sort of thing. We got to a stage where Marjorie and myself said, right, we've really got to start looking for the building. And, and there was all sorts of buildings we looked at in Milton Keynes, and none of them were suitable. And then we heard that this chap had died in Willem, a farmer, Mr. Rees. And the farmhouse was up for sale. Their house, to say the least, was in a dilapidated state. He was an old boy, let it go to rack and ruin. All the farm buildings were falling down. I looked at Marjorie, she looked at me and we said, this is the spot. 
because we knew that those lakes were coming. And we just looked at that position. We couldn't care less about the building. And I made inquiries and it was £56,000. And we got just enough by then to do that. The next big step was to change the village plan. <laughs> so that enabled the, um, the hospice to develop, I think it was three or four houses on the, in between the, the farmhouse and the church. Um, and so that produced some capital enough to be able to expand it. On the 1st of January 1981, we said we're going to take the first patient in. Now, the 1st of January is a public holiday, so there were no public services available, no ambulances available to bring people in. We said we're going to open on the 1st of January. <laughs> and um, we, uh, I took, went out in a car and picked up a patient who happened to be a patient of Marjorie's and she'd made certain that person was available. In its infancy, the hospice had very few paid staff and its successful operation was reliant on the efforts of volunteers and employees going above and beyond, led by the trustees on the Council of Management. We were not spending money if we could possibly help it. We were looking for people who could volunteer. I say the reception was a volunteer. Um, supper was served by volunteers. I remember the first uh, sister we had there, Jean Morn, and I remember her on her hands and knees scrubbing the floor with Rachel Duncan. Rachel Duncan, Lady Duncan, worked for years in the basement of the hospice in its old building, ironing sheets, because in those days everything was hand ironed. And she washed and ironed sheets and she did it for years. A woman of great um, humility and I think humour and kindness and uh, a, a great example for uh, um, for us as, as trustees. Rachel and Jill Tompkins were extraordinary in the early days of fundraising because when we were looking to charitable trusts to try and raise money, there was this great bible of charitable trusts, of you know, obscure trusts, hundreds of them, and it lists all the tr trustees on and I remember sitting one day with the two of them and going through, and between them, they knew a trustee on just about every one. It was absolutely extraordinary, you know, just through personal contacts. Oh, well, I'll write to that one, I know so and so. <laughs> so those are the people that Marjorie somehow got hold of. It was always professional in as much as the, the nurses were very professional and the standard of care was very professional. But the ethos of the place was to make it seem domestic in the early days. These were people who could give care in a near a domestic setting. And we used to actually say to the doctors, you know, you will, you will not come in a white coat sort of thing. <laughs> but just to make it feel more, more comfortable for people. Willan for a long, long time had, uh, had pets. There was Tom, the, the, the ginger, uh, ginger Tom cat. He had um, a thyroid problem. My husband's a veterinary surgeon and um, so Dr John Moyle, who was our consultant at the time, he wrote him a drug chart. So we said, when we were doing the drug round, we'd give Thomas his, his tablets. And uh, he was a poppet. He used to just pick a patient that they see, have, a, have a sense, don't they? They know who likes them. And just slept on their bed the whole time they were there. And when the patient either died or went home, Tom would go off and find another patient, but just absolutely so beautifully attentive. The dog came because one of the very early patients was an old man who lived on his own with his dog. And the Macmillan nurses were sure he ought to come into the hospice and he wouldn't leave his dog. He refused to come in unless the dog came. So the dog came too. I mean, that was the sort of atmosphere. You know, if that's what's needed, that's what what you do. So the dog came in with him and he was with us for a few days, a week or two, and the, the gardener chap used to take the dog for a walk at lunchtime. And then the, the man died and Leslie was all for sort of thinking, oh, now we've got to rehome the dog. And he noticed one day that a patient in the day room who had been very reluctant to talk to anybody and a bit withdrawn was sitting stroking the dog and talking to it. So they said, ah, oh, the dog stays. He's, He's got a purpose. 
In those early days, while some volunteers were helping to run the hospice, others were finding ways to raise money to keep the hospice going. I remember the, the, the woman who did most fundraising before it opened, which was Bet Morgan, and she was incredible. She set up lots of volunteers to sell second-hand goods and things, and she worked for years for Willen Hospice. She did have the whole of the city centre market one Wednesday, I remember this, and we were all up at five o'clock in the morning helping her to get all the stuff to the city centre market to sell. And in that day, Bet made £9,000, which was a lot then. The Friends started in 1981. There was a massive fundraising effort to buy the original property. And after they'd done that, they decided they needed to carry on fundraising to help run the place. In the nearly 40 years we were running, we raised £2.2 .2 million, uh, which is totally amazing. I sometimes don't quite know how we did it, but we did do it. In 1986, Leslie Jell, Chair of the Council of Management, was asked if the hospice would play host to a very notable royal visitor. We were asked at Willow Hospice if Lady Di Diane could come to visit us. When she came, it was a time when AIDS was just becoming known in the area, in, well, in the country. And people were very frightened of it and felt that you shouldn't go near an AIDS patient, you shouldn't touch their hands or anything because you would catch AIDS from doing so. And when Lady Di came, we just admitted our first two aid patients into the hospice. And we walked around and I took her into the room where the first one was. And she immediately went and she sat on his bed and she took his hand and she held it and spoke to him quietly. And then she went to the next room and did exactly the same thing. It was almost unheard of for anybody to want to touch an AIDS patient. She gave so much compassion, and so much love to them. I have to say the patients were thrilled and loved it. It caused some ups and downs because these the visits always do. I mean, we had a big crisis because the security people had to go through the place the day before, checking everything out and everybody out. And we had, I remember there was a big panic on the morning because nobody had thought to give the milkman security clearance. So the poor chap came along to deliver milk and was seen off by the security guards. You know. And then there was no milk for the patients, so one of the nurses had to go out and buy milk. You know, it was that sort of... We weren't set up for that sort of thing, really. It was a highlight of my life to have started off the technology in this hospice. I was working for a company called Amazon Computers and the hospice was fairly newly formed and we saw some information about it and I thought with the advance of these new computers that were now going onto people's desks maybe the hospice could benefit from one. So I knew Les Gell, so I got an appointment here and met the staff here. And the nurses, four of them, that's all there were then, uh, were particularly interested in having a computer that they could do their word processing on. And so I had to do a presentation to the Board of Trustees and they were not keen on having a computer because they thought it would be too modern for their vision of the hospice. And so I went back and told the nurses and they said, keep trying. Well, I did, and for six months I kept going backwards and forwards, and in the end, the thing that made them uh, give in was that I offered to train the staff in how to use the word processor and the computer, and so they agreed. And from that moment on, every single Wednesday afternoon, for the next something like 20 years, I came and helped people here with computers. And then I worked um, for a company called Pegasus, uh, with them and so I got them to donate the first real program which was payroll 
And the guy then, Ted Lazarus, who was doing the payroll and finance, said that it used to take him almost three days to do the pay for the staff. And in my giving the payroll to them, I got that donated for free. It then took him three hours. So he was more than pleased. It was in 1986 that Anne secured the donation for the hospice's first computer. Two years later, the hospice's first charity shop was opened in Bletchley. The merchandise was initially collected and processed at Woolen in Betts Barn, named after volunteer Bet Morgan. The first time I got involved with Woolen, I think, was um, back in 1990, when I was actually made redundant. I, I remember being in Bletchley one day, and I saw the Woolen Hospice shop. And I'll be perfectly frank, I didn't know what the hospice did, what it was, what it did. So I made some inquiries um, and obviously found out some more about it and uh, became a volunteer. And I remember um, helping with uh, delivering the goods to the, what then we had to, the hospice had two shops. I think it was Leslie saying we should, we should get involved in shops, but that, that was a whole new area of activity and it, it needed people to run it. That was, was how it, it just it grew and needed proper management. As the hospice grew, we needed more staff, and so they, they organised uh, proper cooks for the kitchen and um, the laundry and, and more staff for the cleaning, and that's how it went on. You know, so at the end, I was in charge of the, the volunteers in the laundry, and, you know, we had lovely volunteer coordinators as well. We were, we were rather hands-on in those days as a council um, because we didn't have a management structure. Um, we had a sister in charge to whom the, all the nurses were obviously responsible and there was a very professional structure there. But the rest of the structure was really the council managing it because we didn't, we didn't pay a manager to start with. The, you know, that was just how it, how it worked. It took a little while before we started paying a, a manager. And big decisions like can we afford someone else in the kitchen and how to get the garden done, you know, things that wouldn't, would now be just looked after by management. The council got involved in because cause we were free and we could do it. <laughs> this volunteer-led arrangement came to an end in 1989 when the Council of Management took the opportunity to review the whole structure of the hospice in the light of increasing demands upon it. They decided to appoint a matron who would primarily be a nurse manager as opposed to a hands-on nurse and a full-time general manager instead of a part-time bursar. Leslie Gell resigned as chairman of the council and successfully applied for the position of general manager with Julian Pedley taking over the role of chairman. The Council of Management also made the decision to appoint their first paid fundraising manager. The position that was being advertised was primarily to uh, manage a capital appeal to raise a million pounds uh, for uh, a new extension, the, the very first extension to the hospice. Um, and uh, that was going to increase the number of beds from 10 to 25 and uh, a new day centre. There were a number of people, or some people, who uh, thought at the time, well, why do we need to pay somebody to fundraise? I mean, it, <laughs> I think those words might echo a bit these days, um, now that the hospice has grown to the size it has. The appeal lasted until about 1994, when the uh, Duchess of Kent came to open the new extension. Once the appeal had been reached and the, the extension was being built, there was a change in emphasis, of course, because obviously having gone from 10 to 25 beds, it was no good having all those extra beds if we, if we didn't then have the ongoing funding um, to pay for all the staff. The, the difficult moments when we were running out of money um, and when we were looking at budgets for a year without really any way of knowing how we were 
how we were going to do it. And Leslie Jell would just present this and say, no, don't worry about it, God will provide. And I remember saying to him in the finance committee, Leslie, I'm sure, but I'd feel an awful lot more comfortable approving this budget if I knew how he was going to do it. You know? One year I do remember, and I, I regret this bitterly really, there was a, a big squeeze on resources and our charity giving fell. And we decided we could not employ the numbers of staff that we had and that we would have to close some beds and well fire some nurses that's what it came to and uh, retire them or um, make them redundant we were really worried that we were going to run the hospice into the ground you know that was my biggest mistake i think not you know managing our way out of it which would have been you know, I suppose going to the community, the community would have, and they did, of course. Within a year, everything was back to uh, to normal. Um, and it is actually miraculous, I think. Amazing that the local community stands behind the hospice, I think, because they know it's for them and works for them, and uh, they're prepared to well, I would say uh, extremely generous. Most of the people in Milton Keynes are not rich. <laughs> in 2014, my wife was 79 at that time. She had a, an operation for bowel cancer and they came back and said they couldn't do anything about it. So. The doctor then arranged for her to come into the hospice. The room itself was beautiful. It overlooked the lake. The food was excellent. The nursing was lovely. The people were so understanding and kind. I can't imagine it being better. You know, we were very grateful to Willen. I, I don't think people realise it was all free of charge. We um, talked about what we could do to thank them. We decided between us that I'd try and do a sponsored walk. A few of my friends, next door neighbours, people like that said they'd join me. From that, I think we did about three laps of the uh, Willen Lake. Then in the afternoon, I thought, well, I'll see if I can do a bit more because it was a, a sort of a test of me, you know, um, to show to my wife that uh, what she meant to me because we were married 54 years. And then sadly, my wife died. I mentioned it at Rotary. The president at that time, he said, I think we ought to do something about this, see if we can have a go and do something really worthwhile. The um, hospice itself said, we've got a, a community bus. They were going to have it refitted or fitted out with more um, things. So it became a, more like an ambulance. So I think we then started to call it Hazel's Ambulance. We set out a program to raise uh, about £34,000. Now that was maybe almost twice as much as we had raised in many years. So Hazel's ambulance was then purchased and it was fitted out. And then we had a presentation here uh, at the hospice. Just brilliant. You know, and it gave me a lot of satisfaction. It also is a good reminder actually how decent people are you know, because all this money came from the local community pretty well. It's 1998 and the hospice needs to move into a new phase. The trustees on the Council of Management feel that they need to appoint their first CEO, a figurehead to lead the hospice team into the next generation. The person they choose is Christopher Eyes. I've never ever gone for a formal interview 
uh, without first having gone for an informal visit. And so uh, I rang up uh, Leslie Gell and said I'd like to uh, visit prior to putting my application form in. And I can honestly say, hand on heart, that as soon as I crossed the threshold into Willing Hospice, uh, I felt this is, it, it was just the, the environment, uh, the atmosphere, uh, the volunteer I met on the reception desk, which was the initial greeting I received, but also I had the opportunity of meeting with one or two patients and families, and that uh, really clinched it for me. I thought, I want this job. Christopher Eyes, and he was incredible. He knew all the patients' names, all the relatives' names, all the staff, the nurses, the doctors, the cleaners, and all the volunteers and the cooks and everything. And he went round every day talking to all of us. Yeah. So he made us feel good. During the 10 years I was there, uh, our service became much more focused and comprehensive. Uh, we had key specialised staff in post, uh, pain specialists, family care support workers, bereavement support workers, lymphedema specialists. We were really a specialist palliative care unit at the hospice. So we had moved, we had that transition from offering a traditional uh, in-bed uh, patient service to a very much community focused. Patients are coming in as a, either as a day patient or attending a, a clinic and then back home with a real expanded hospice at home team. So the, the services have developed significantly, and rightly so. The other thing I think the I was very pleased to have been able to do was to appoint a full-time chaplain, Steve Barnes, so that everyone, you know, the emotional and psychological and spiritual aspects of one's life and the bereavement process and so on, I mean, Steve is a man who brings hope and joy. <laughs> That's just what you need. It's always been quite difficult to explain a chaplain's job. Um, but uh, I suppose I got a reputation just for hanging around, sitting down, drinking tea and eating cake and talking with people. But I got asked all kinds of questions that people... Oh, I, I, I won't ask the nurse because... They're obviously too busy. The doctor's already given them the answer, but in a language they don't understand. Um, so they often ask me uh, questions. Well, what's it going to be like at the end? He, he always looked like he was very laid back, but he wasn't. He had his finger on the pulse, literally, you know. And uh, he was instrumental in, in helping in terms of staff support. He knew what was going on. Staff knew that they could go and speak to Steve confidentially, you know, and uh, staff need to know that as well. That's really important. And uh, no, a real crucial member of the team, uh, the, hospital, the, the hospice chaplain, very, very important. I must admit that there were very rare occasions where I actually felt low. I just saw, we all at the hospice see such heroism, such courage, minute by minute, that you just think, wow, you're just seeing the absolute best of, of the human spirit. When my mother was diagnosed with cancer, she was being supported by the Willing at Home team. When they visited my mum at home, they decided that actually it was time for her to go into the hospice. So it was quite nice that somebody actually came to the house rather than us having to go to the doctor or take her to the hospital. Um, and they arranged you know, access to a bed at the hospice for her very, very quickly. And then when we actually came to the hospice, we realised the whole family were welcome. She had a room right next to the family room. So we, we literally took over that space, as did other families. It was, um, it was always busy with somebody's family making a cup of tea or just having a, a bit of time out um, from sitting with their loved one. Whilst my mum was at the hospice, the staff were very, very caring. They would come into the room very quietly and discreetly 
and do whatever checks they needed to do, make sure we were all okay. Often at 2 a.m. when we were all very, very tired, there was tea, toast, whatever we, we needed really. Um, and you know, lots of kindness from the staff um, for us as well as for our mum. I first became aware of the Tree of Life at Willen after Mum had died when I was wandering around the garden. Um, to raise funds for the hospice, you're able to purchase a metal leaf inscribed with the name of your loved one. So I arranged to do that for my mum. And that's the place where I like to think of my mum, where we come on Mother's Day, where we come on her birthday, Christmas Day. and. It's nice to know that it's raising funds for the hospice, but also giving us somewhere that we can come back and remember mum, but also remember the lovely care that she received from the hospice. I don't think Woolen Hospice was as high profile as it could have been. And I think once we started getting out there in the community and really giving out that message of what the hospice did, um, that's when I think the knowledge started to, and groups started to get in touch with us and we started meeting other groups as well when we were out in the community and it just sort of snow, started snowballing. People thought that you, you just came there to die, that you had to pay a percentage of your, your pension or whatever you were admitted there, that you were for elderly people only, that you were for cancer only. All these myths, you know, were around and quite embellished within the community there, imprinted in the community. So we had a bit of a, you know, a, a task to start to change those and bring those people up to date. Uh, so I think it was getting us out there and getting that message out of what we actually offered. And people started coming to us, which was fantastic. Supporting. Caring. Making a difference. We appointed a marketing person because it helped be consistent with our messaging and be consistent in what we're trying to achieve out there. It sounds corporate, but you know, when you're looking for a significant amount of money, you have to be credible in how you approach businesses, how you get your foot in the door is the first thing. And that's why networking for me was really important. Chris Eyes was always saying, you know, I've got to make a difference. I said, well, you are, but don't worry. <laughs> Fundraising was always the, the issue, and I think even to my last days at the, the hospice, it was something that oh, I used to wake up at night because you could never guarantee funding. You'd get a small proportion of funding from the NHS, but uh, of course nowhere near what the hospice uh, requires. We got a fantastic fundraising committee uh, going, um, fundraising team, very well planned uh, programme of fundraising events that involved the businesses and so on. From day one, successful fundraising has been the key to the hospice providing the range and quality of care that it does. Currently, £5.9 million a year needs to be raised, and this is done in a myriad of ways, from shops to a lottery, from legacies to grants from foundations. But most importantly of all, from the efforts and pockets of the people of Milton Keynes. And the watchword for many of these major events is having fun. My favourite event of the year has to be the Ladies' Royal Ascot Day, where 120 ladies dress up for an afternoon of drinking champagne and horse race betting, with the obvious results that come from that, and so it becomes noisier and more fun as the afternoon goes on. And the women that come to this event, they get dressed up incredibly, sort of beautifully, as if they're really going to Ladies' Day at Ascot and just have a great deal of fun, a few glasses of champagne and have a, a bet on the tote, watch the races. Um, sometimes they're not quite walking quite as straight as they were when they came into the event as they leave, but it's just really lovely to see people enjoying themselves, um, but also raising lots of money for the hospice. <laughs> I've never participated in them in Ascot, alternative Ascot, 
But I remember as a nurse always having a nose, <laughs> looking out of the window. We were fascinated by the hats, the costumes, and the raucous noise outside. You know, you could hear it. Years ago, you could hear it from the wards. And, but, you know, it was great fun. And I think for patients, you know, just having a nose outside if they could, was fun for them as well. The most memorable fundraising event for me would be the first Midnight Moo we did. Uh, the pressure was on in 2009 because of the financial global situation to really pull something um, with a large audience to raise some big money. And it was a tough role because I didn't get any extra staff, but everyone mucked in staff, volunteers, trustees, managed to pull it off. But I do remember being in the fundraising office at the time when two of my colleagues came back from a meeting and said that they, they'd had this site or it'd been discussed, we were going to have this event and we're going to call it the Midnight Moo. And it was for women only. And I sort of thought, oh, I don't know if that will work. I don't know how wrong was I. first year we did it we got the thousand ladies and we ended up raising a net profit of a hundred thousand pound um, and the second year after being allowed to employ somebody to run that event full time we netted 225,000 so for me then apart from all the community events which were amazing and being involved with all of them I think for me the most memorable fundraising had to be that legacy we left behind for that event, it was amazing. I had a, a wonderful memory of the Midnight Moo because I was always in charge here at the hospice of all the runners, the racers, and they all had to check in at various checkpoints. And it was my job to make sure they got back home safely. And this one time there was a young girl and I lost track of her, couldn't find her. And I was really worried because going through Milton Keynes city centre at night is not a very good thing for them. And so I was trying everywhere to find her. We're now at five o'clock in the morning and I've been there all night, still can't find her, when eventually I found out that she had a brother. So I phoned his number and he said, oh yes, yeah, she's here home, she's asleep. She gave up halfway through. I said, oh, thanks very much for telling me. <laughs> to find out how much it cost for the hospice to look after my mum. And then we made a decision that, right, we're going to fundraise and that's how much we're going to, to raise so that we can pay the hospice back. And I think within a week of mum passing, Vanessa was like, right, the midnight moves on. <laughs> so that was our first thing. So we all signed up for the midnight move and we did that for a few years and that sort of started our fundraising um, kick really and it just it just escalated from there. Um, Vanessa had always wanted to do the marathon. One night we were at an event for Willen and while talking to um, one of the fundraisers she sort of said oh would you want to do the marathon and I went I mean yeah glass of champagne in hand can't see why not so she put the form in front of me and made me sign up there and then <laughs> so I was uh, that was October the marathon was April so I had from October to April to train and prepare myself for my first marathon. So I'd done 2013, 2014, 2020, 2021 so far for the hospice um, with multiple different events in between as well. For a few years we've done a or we did a golf tournament. We've done a, a pub games day where we had a pool and darts competition and again we always throw in a raffle and an auction when we do these things and, and people know when they come to our events that they leave with empty pockets and they're happy to do that. Yeah. I love it, it was really funny, I was exhausted after our quiz night and I couldn't wait to get into bed. I think I passed out for about three hours and then woke up 
about 3 a.m. thinking, oh, what can we do next? We do set targets on ourselves and um, the three and a half thousand is something that sticks in our mind because it was a figure Michelle was told back in 2012 that it... Yeah. So it's three. So three thousand. Yeah. Um, but it, we'd like to over it. It would cost to, yeah. for that care. So yeah, it's three thousand is always our kind of rough goal. So we want to do a lot more than that and always yeah. get more and achieve more because they need it so much. You know, they are funded mostly by fundraising they don't get all this money landing in their lap. So if it isn't for people like us and our kind families and friends, then families after us aren't gonna have the hospice there. The feeling we get from everything we do for the hospice is, it's a good warm feeling inside, I think, is a good way to describe it. We can sit back and know that we're helping keep on a legacy that's helped so many people. And we can sit down at night and go, oh, we raised a grand today, or we raised 50 pounds a day. Every time we do something, it makes us feel really good and it keeps me positive in times when maybe I don't want to be positive or I want to cry. I'm not going to cry now. Yeah, good. But it means a lot to us. Yeah. An essential part of the team are the volunteers who would come in and do the afternoon teas, help serve lunches, and they were still doing the laundry when I was, you know, when I was there. Um, uh, escorting patients to various appointments and so on, sitting with patients in daycare. I mean, there, there are so many aspects of the hospice that would not survive if it were not for the volunteers. I think volunteers are sometimes underrated because they bring lots of skills with them. And I think it's down to the charity to identify those skills and put them to good use. I got involved after I'd been made redundant, uh, walking down the high street in Stony Stratford, saw the bookshop, loved books, went in, said yes, you can start as a volunteer at the bookshop. I didn't realise when I started volunteering how entertaining it would be, because um, I helped run the bookshop as well, we're volunteer led, so we're part of a a four-man four team running, running that. All of the volunteers who, who work in the bookshop um, have made it a real success. And somebody said to Rita fairly recently, this is better than a real bookshop. Because it is a real bookshop, but I understand what he means. One, one of the best events that we have at the shop, and um, it's the Classic Car, Vintage Car Day and Classic Car Day. It's run twice a year in Stony Stratford. And we open the shop up. Dave's the main seller of the books because he, he knows cars much much more than the ladies that are there. Now, of course, we don't actually sell books at the car day. People give us a donation to the hospice and I give them a book as a thank you. So, and in that way, people are very much more generous because instead of giving us two pounds for a book, they will quite often pass over paper money instead. Uh, and then I give them the book as a thank you. And we've raised a, a lot of money in the course of a day for, for, for each car day. The hospice couldn't cope without the volunteers that do all the work here. And they do that work for free and tirelessly. In all manner of ways, in every department, there's a volunteer. In every fundraising event, there is a volunteer. And you can't buy that, money can't buy that dedication. And that dedication comes from everyone's love of what this hospice does for all the patients and for the ethos of what cancer does to people. Um, so it's a tribute really, a tribute by Milton Keynes for Will and Hospice and that's what it's all about and that's what's kept me here. The reason that I've stayed and helped Willen, I think is because you get an amazing feeling of well-being for what you're doing. You feel like you're giving back. I've had a good life. Um, touch wood, I haven't lost anybody through cancer, but I would like to hope that if I did have someone with cancer that they would get the wonderful care that the people here get. And we need to fund it. We need to keep it going. So whatever I can do to help the hospice, that's what needs to be done. 
I mean, I, I've raked in my daughter onto stools and her friend and my husband. You know, we spent one day in uh, Stony Stratford in December where it was minus three degrees on an outside stool and we were all there all day. And I got back to the car and I went to get in the car and I thought, hang on, I don't bend in the middle anymore. <laughs> I'm so cold. <laughs> and you end up looking like a Michelin man because you've got about 15 layers on. But you still feel that immense well-being and camaraderie that means you've done a good thing. Palliative care is, comes from the Greek word to palios, I think it is, and it means to cloak or to cover. And I've always thought, you know, it's, a, it's about looking after people, giving them a hug, having the time to give them their time. I think personally for me, it's all about being able to give your time. Mm. And obviously on a busy yeah. ward, as I've worked on, I'm sure you've worked on, you, you haven't got that time. You might be on with a, another agency nurse looking after 28 patients, and it's very generalised, whereas here, it's specialised care and you can really give your time. It doesn't matter if you need to spend half an hour, an hour talking to somebody. If that's what they need and you're able to give that time, then to them that can make such a difference. Mm. I think when I first came here, it's a totally different way of working. It was like, oh, should we go and wash a few people? No, yeah. and if they want it, and you think, oh, we're not, not going to get up there and wash everybody, you know. No, they'll ask if they want to they wash. Got you know, wash by nine they've got to be washed by nine <laughs> o'clock. Like in a, in a hospital, you're like, come on, next, wash. But no, it's, um, it's just so, what they want, it's what they want rather than what we want. So you, you have to sort of change how you work, but it is much more, you know, tranquil and, you know, mm. calm, yeah. You do get care in a hospital, you know, it's not like you don't, but acute hospitals are just not set up for the kind of holistic care that a hospital is set up to. What you have here is under one roof to meet the social care needs, the psychology needs, the spiritual needs of the person that's dying, other than their, you know, physical or medical needs. So it's kind of like a one-stop shop. And that, that I think, makes, makes the difference. It's the environment as well, you know, hospital is beds, really, whereas you can have a lovely room to themselves. Family can come. And with dying, it's not just the patient, it's family members, it's close friends as well. And that can be accommodated within a hospice. You care not just for the dying person, but you care for everybody around them as well, which you can't quite do in a hospital because hospitals are not set up to do that really. Whilst I might not directly work with um, families and their relatives, we have teams who are here to support them and work with them and listen to their fears and anxieties and support them as best we can. They mustn't be forgotten. And it's not just about the care we provide on the inpatient units, it's that a fantastic willing at home nurses go into people's homes and allow them to, to die at home if that's what they choose to do you know, and support them in that way and support their families and their friends. It's a real privilege actually going into someone's home to look after that loved one. And I think, again, that's what makes us feel so proud as well. You know, a family who don't know you are letting you into their home so that we're able to do what we can do. We had quite a few weddings each year, about half a dozen a year. Um, quite often, uh, somebody would be uh, a patient would be would be saying, "We always meant to get married, but never got round to it somehow." Um, we've been together twenty years or so, you know. 
I used to warn them, don't say anything like that because by, by mid-afternoon we could have you married. <laughs> and we often did. The local wedding shops would lend us some dresses, you know, and someone would ring up Marks and Spencers and they'd provide us with a cut. We could turn a wedding over in, in 24 hours if needs be. And they're wonderful occasions because um, the kitchen always baked a cake and provided a few bottles of bubbly. Nurses would decorate the room, put a do not disturb sign on the door and, and just really make a huge fuss. And uh, they were just great occasions, yeah. Woolen is a very special place, I think. When you think about, um, you know, over the years, nurses have stayed, staff have stayed at Woolen a long time. Because I believe, you know, it is a special place. People want to give back. They want to do a good job. Um, they're dedicated. And I think dedication is key. You know, and I think nowadays, if you didn't love the place that you work, um, yes, people do go. But there's still a lot of people here who've been at Willen for some years. I'm one of them. <laughs> My husband said to me when I came back to work, he said, well, just do it for a couple of years just to get a, a head above water. And here I am 32 years later. Um, I think it's the place. I always call it um, a California, a Hotel California moment. You can check out any time you like, but you can never leave. And that's, that's the hospice. So many people have left and come back. I mean, I absolutely love coming to work. You know, there's not a minute, I, you know, the morning I don't wake up and think no. I've got to go to work today. I absolutely hand on heart love what yeah, I do. me too. I, 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 I love to say I work at Willen. Mm -hmm. Really love to say I work at Willen. I feel proud. proud. From when it initially opened more than 40 years ago until now, the Council of Management and Staff have been constantly developing and expanding the services that Will and Hospice can provide to meet the needs of the Milton Keynes community. The latest example of this is the Building a Legacy project, which will deliver 21st century hospice care for local people. The proposition that we had about 10 years ago wasn't, wasn't really fit for purpose now. It's very much about the family. Before, the, the, we had rooms where people, um, our, our patients came and they stayed, uh, but fam there was no real provision for family there. And a lot more of what the offering will be is about the family having place to go when their loved ones are here. There's the ability of families to stay in the hospice with their loved ones. Um, there's a cafe where people can meet and talk about things because we had no cafe before. We, I think we had, a, we had a chocolate machine or something which sold boxes of chocolates and things like that. But the, this, will take, this will put the hospice in a good place for 2050. I mean, we've got plan you know, MK 2050, and this puts the hospice exactly four square in that, in that offering. It is a business, it's, very, it's got over 160 staff, etc. But those people believe in Willand, and I think that's the point. They believe in it, and people who believe, they're like a family, they, they inter interweave themselves with each other. But that doesn't mean we shouldn't be looking out. Fam good families will always look after their neighbours. We're trying to extend that reach into people we haven't really touched yet. Um, it's about the environment, isn't it? And that's really important for the people that come here. Um, when we get the new building, every room will have a lake view. I mean, money can't buy that really. It's, it's just, it will be a beautiful thing um, for the spirits of the people that will be in that rooms and for their families when they come. The, the new Lakeview Lounge, it used to be, we used to have one that was much further away, is literally sitting on top of the lake. Beautiful cafe underneath for the relatives to use and, and us to use as well. A lot of thought's been put into that sort of thing. I think it's going to be an amazing space for the 
um, patients and for the people that are visiting them. And I think it will be nice for people to be able to come in from outside for a coffee and perhaps see what actually goes on in the hospice. It's opening the doors to the place and not making it the building by the lake. We don't want the hospice just to be seen as a, you know, as it is a white middle class, if I can put it that way. It's not. It is for everybody. And that's what we're doing. And we've got fantastic supporters in all the communities, but they're in little pockets and we need to widen that to a much wider, diverse group of people. Because look at Milton Keynes. When, when we were here, when I came in 1981, it was, it's morphed into one heck of a place since then. And there's a lot more people coming in and we just need to get that engagement. I would also like to see us as a centre of excellence in the region and possibly in the UK to extend the training, the knowledge about, uh, about palliative care generally. Really getting the community more of an understanding of what we do and getting into the education piece, so whether it's technical education or educating the local community in a wider sense, that would be it for me. I think we've done all right. There's no doubt that there isn't a more loved charity, I don't think, in Milton Keynes. And everybody realises the fantastic job that everybody does here. care and love of everyone, whether it be Dawn who's the fundraising, one of the fundraising managers, or the hospice nurses, everybody loves it. Yeah. And they just, they live and breathe the hospice. It's not just a job, it's not just a, a charity, it's, it is the community in Milton Keynes. Yeah. And I think that's why we all love it. Willen does have a, a really, really strong place in the hearts of people. I, I think it's because it's at this most emotional time of life. Um, the fear around death, the worries about what's going to happen, and kind of the hospice, Willen Hospice just kind of puts their arms around you. 
that's it, it's okay, it's all right, we'll look after you.